Um, all right, so uh, this wasn't a very busy chapter, um, a lot more discussion based than like hands on keyboard. So um, it'll hopefully go pretty quickly. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're talking about servers, which uh, we saw set up, what was it, like almost a month ago now. Um, uh, so we're going to talk about just sort of the kind of different decisions that people are going to make. So um, at a high level, what we need to think about when we're choosing a server is like, what exactly are these servers doing? Um, especially for the cloud, it's like, you know, all ephemeral and nobody really knows what's going on. So you got to start like with the basics. And um, Alex, the writer, suggests that we just like overview like what is computing. Um, so I like to think of it as like, you know, a computer, the best way that I ever heard it described was like a computer is like a classroom of like middle schoolers or like elementary school kids who like, they know how to add numbers together, but that's about it. Um, but if you get a large enough classroom, you can actually solve very, very big problems. Um, because if you ask one kid to just add one number and the next kid to add the next number after that and the next kid and the next kid, um, you can do some very complex mathematical operations. And that's all a computer does. Um, it's just an adding machine. And it just like has all of these little like transistors that are all like just doing one addition after addition after addition after addition. Um, and you can think of each of those um, like transistors as little kids and you can think of the uh, what are called cores in a computer as like each like grouping of little desks that these kids are at. Um, and uh, so like when it comes to computing, most of what limitations that we have are physically limited by the uh, computer cores, like the number of little desks in a classroom and the uh, clock itself, like how tired those kids are, like, you know, how good at math those kids are that day. Um, and that's basically all that you need to think about when it comes to computing. Um, and what we like, when we sort of abstract that a little bit more, um, what you get is the CPU. The CPU is like the physical brain of the computer where all of these transistors live. Um, and so uh, as, a phys as, as like a, a, a official definition, you could think of course as the available processing centers in your CPU, in your brain. Um, most of these, most of the uh, common uh, machines that we can get today are between four and 32. So that's what you can buy um, on the market these days. Um, and the clock speed, that's like how many operations that these um, uh, cores can do um, is between two to five gigahertz and gigahertz is 2.5, is two to five billion operations per second. So you don't really need a computer with like, you know, 80 cores. You just need a computer that has cores that can do things very, that has a, a core that can do things very quickly. Um, and this is just um, Moore's law um, that, you know, most people should be familiar with. Um, basically the idea that the number of transistors in a computer chip uh, doubles every two years. And you can see that in this uh, Y axis here, it's a pseudo log axis. Um, and what we're finding is that, um, I wanted to do a little bit of background reading for this. And what we're finding is that, you know, even though these transistors are going up, um, you know, al almost exponentially, they're definitely going up logarithmically, um, the clocks don't really influence how fast our computing is nowadays. It's just a matter of like how we're using our cores. And that's to say like, we're packing all these transistors into computers, um, and that's not necessarily what's making like AWS run so fast and so clean. It's the fact that there are like very smart engineers who are making decisions about which core is going to take which operation and at what time. So you don't have like as a as a data scientist, you don't really have to worry about like buying a computer with a big number on the box. <laughs> basically, you just have to worry about what packages you're using that are making use of these cores. Did you see uh, that uh, uh, okay. Gordon Moore, the, the guy that Moore's Law is named after, he died last week. He died last week? Yeah. Yeah. Kidding me. That was one of those where I was like, oh, that's sad. And I had no idea that he was alive. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. I had no idea he was alive either. Oh, my yeah. goodness. So oh, that's historic then. Yeah. 
Ah, oh, wow. Well, definitely pour one out for him. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. So like, the, obviously the question is like, how do I go faster, right? Um, and like I mentioned before, fewer faster cores is usually better than having lots and lots and lots of slow cores. Um, because for data science, that's really, really all that we need. We don't need to do multi-core stuff, although um, I'll talk a little bit um, about how um, to manage that. And Alex's recommendation um, is in your servers, the number of cores that you need is just basically one core per user plus one um, to keep it light. Um, but there is sort of this nuance that like you'll probably know when you need more cores if you're not like using your packages efficiently. Which brings us to this next topic of GPU. Um, so these were um, chips that were initially built for like graphical operations. So, you know, making video, um, image analysis, um, a little bit of audio processing. And basically the idea is that like they're, phys they're built physically differently from um, regular CPU chips. We don't need to go into the details about that, but like all you need to know is that they are usually more of them in a processor and they're slower. So while a consumer grade CPU has four to 16, mid-range GPUs might have 700 to 4,000, which is a lot, um, but look at the slowdown, one to 10% speed of the CPU core, which is you know considerable. Um, but the reason why they're popular in data science is because they help with uh, paralyzing, parallelizing uh, operations that need many, 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 parallel um, uh, computations to be done at once. And so if you think about like neural nets where people are fitting these like, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, nodes in their network or like random forests or any tree-based models, things like that. So the question for a data scientist is, should you be getting a GPU? Usually the answer is no. Um, for most people and most of the work that like I'm familiar with, that most people that I work with are familiar with, like if you, know how to use packages if you know how to write good code and you know how to use um, the number of cores that you're given um, you're going to be just fine um, and i kind of think you'll know you need a gpu when you get there um, because you would have exhausted every other opportunity basically like getting a gpu shouldn't be your first like how do i make this foster decision but I wanted to also open that up to anybody who's attending today and you know, get to give your thoughts and ideas on uh, whether you have a GPU, whether you've um, thought about buying a GPU and what were the circumstances that led to that. I just bully my CPU. <laughs> just torture the heck out of the thing, right? Yeah, I mean, like I'm fortunate enough to have at home at least like some nice cpus and then at work i have integrated graphics so like the other day i was using so much ram that my graphics dropped because i apparently stole from the graphics memory and lost my monitors so yeah so i i think that's a perfect example of like you'll know when you get there <laughs> uh yeah, I, I've done um, like NLP stuff and for that GPU, like super, super does matter. Like it's uh, orders of magnitude faster. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I did, it took a little bit of setup to get it to actually use the GPU and I could definitely tell when I had succeeded. <laughs> yeah. Because it's yeah. like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That, that like immediately finished instead of taking hours and hours and hours. So. Right. Yeah. And I'm guessing that um, NLP, like the reason that it's good for this GPU setup is sort of like the bag of words, kind of not thousands, thousands, millions of units. Not uh, beyond bag of words, going into deep learning. Um, ah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's doing uh, just tons of parallel calculations. Right. Um, yeah, I totally agree. And I, like I, you hear the fancy words about like fancy hardware should i do this and do that that like that's not really what makes you a cool data scientist um what makes you a cool data scientist is having rewritten you know apply <laughs> <laughs>
in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about RAM. Um, basically, short-term memory. So um, the best way to think about it is like you open up R or R Studio and you, you know, do a lot of stuff. You type in your variables and then, you know, you shut your laptop, you put it in your backpack and you go home. You open up your laptop again and R is crashed and all your work is gone. That's that's RAM. <laughs> um, and basically, you, probably, you pretty much want to get a computer with a lot of RAM just, um, you know, just because people have bad, you know, resource management habits, myself included. Um, and uh, Alex gives this handy dandy recommendation here. Um, the max amount of data that you want to store in memory at a time, multiply it by three, and that should be like the size of the uh, RAM that you should purchase in a computer. Um, but generally, like, I think there's been a recent push to like move things away from uh, having things in your short-term memory in, in R. Like, it's just not a great idea for the example that I just alluded to. Um, and so... Alex doesn't mention this explicitly, but I wanted to also just like mention that there are a lot of options for um, moving things away from uh, RAM and moving them to what's called disk. Um, and so that means that instead of like having your, instead of like saying load CSV and it's a five gigabyte CSV, you just say um, start a connection to a file on disk. And while I'm running R, the connection to the file on disk can pull and push data towards that uh, file. Um, the R process can pull and push data towards that file. Um, and there are a lot of options for this. The most recent one, um, and since we are you know, interested and um, more leaning towards Posit and their products, the most recent one that's important to think about is Arrow, um, because Arrow does have Posit support. Um, it's a great package that just says, you know, if you have uh, an on disk file, usually a parquet file or a feather file, there's lots of different options. Um, this allows you to like do really quick reading and writing as well as um, keeping stuff on disk. There's other options too. If you want to get into databases, definitely do that. Databases are going to be super useful for anybody. Um, if you're a Python fan, there's Dask. Dask is useful. And um, if you're into bioconductor or if you're in that realm of like uh, biological sciences, bioinformatics, there's HDF5, um, which is also a very, very efficient, very cool um, package. It just keeps your file on disk and then you can access it um, as though it were a data frame, even though it's like 13 gigabytes or whatever. I think um, yeah, go ahead, Gus. Just Everything being stored in RAM was probably a factor of old spinning disk hard drives. But now that like you can get solid state drives that have like eight gigabit like read and write speeds, if you're going like top tier, like the the latency between RAM and actual storage starts to matter less and less yeah and then once you start adding in fancy like tools like database and arrow it just gets faster and faster right and again like i think that just speaks to the fact that like there are very smart people who have gone ahead of us and solved these problems you know like we should like i think like sure the recommendation of getting a lot of ram is good but people have already solved the problem of like read and write and we can just rely on like these packages to help us through. I, so I'll, I'll push back that, but also RAM tends to be pretty cheap and like a really easy solution to a lot of things where you don't have to think a lot about how to make the thing work. You just like, I, I maxed out the RAM on my laptop. Uh, I guess it's a few years ago now. And like, uh, do not regret that decision because it makes a lot of things way easier when I don't have to worry about, oh yeah, I can load that entire archive dumped from a uh, Wiktionary mm -hmm. into my RAM all at once. Um, so things like that. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely agree. Um, so, I, and yeah, and this goes into the 
the next um, next slide, which is about disk storage, and it it's it's so cheap nowadays to get a lot of disk storage as compared to you know a decade ago, two decades ago. Um, so definitely shell out for more disk and more RAM. Um, because like, especially when you're buying a computer, you want, this is the sort of product that you want to last a long time and you want to have uh, staying power. And at this point, like solid state, solid, solid state drives, excuse me, um, are pretty much here to stay. I don't see anything getting much better than that anytime soon. So, um, you know, go ahead and spend some money on a couple SSDs on, uh, and on some fancy RAM. As, uh, as John said. Um, yeah, okay, so there was a, a couple of scenarios that I thought would be worth talking about as part of the um, uh, addressing the learning objectives. <clears throat> so you try to load a big CSV file into pandas and Python, it turns for a while and then crashes. Um, what should be your um, reproach? Um, any thoughts from you guys first before I give mine? Like first guess would be, is the CSV just what I need? Or is there like extra stuff in there? And then after that, if I do need it, then probably switch to like Arrow because it works with Python and R and basically all the other stuff. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, this it means that it's a a, a RAM problem, right? So we need to. There's a bottleneck of like how much data is able to to be uh read um by ram in that like short-term memory and so that means that you either need to find a way to get more ram which is not always the option or you need to find a package that can help optimize that read write um uh op operation so yeah definitely go for something like arrow um but yes, definitely look at your data first. See if you can open it in a text editor or something and uh, you know, read in like three lines or something first. Um, okay, so the next one, you go to, be, to build a new uh, machine learning model on your data. You'd like to retrain the model once a day, but it turns out training this model takes 26 hours on your laptop. How would you um, go about finding a solution for this? That sounds likely to be a compute problem. Um, and depending what you're doing, like that could be a case where GPU is useful, but it also could just be, you know, more cores or just, or, or just don't, you know, maybe don't use all of the data. Mm -hmm. It's also often a solution to this kind of thing. Um, you probably don't need to go back all the way in history forever. Um, so, yeah, that that's a good recommendation. Thoughts. <laughs> That's a very good recommendation. I, I've I've fallen into the into that trap before. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> mm. Okay, so now the last one, you design a visualization in Matplotlib and create a whole bunch um, in a loop, and you want to parallelize the operation. Right now, you're running on a T2 uh, small uh, tier server on AWS with one CPU. Um, should you increase the server size? Should you not? Um, how can you go about parallelizing that on a server? So I'll give my thoughts because I, I wasn't 100% sure because I didn't know the parameters of this. Um, but I would say that based on the um, recommendation that the number of cores is not the number of CPUs, of course. Um, 
you can still parallelize it. Um, you need you just need to um, go through the process of like figuring out how many cores you're given in the uh, T two um, instance on AWS, and you can do that really really easily with um, uh, the for each package. You can do it with um, the future package. There's a lot of different things that you can use, or you could just like go into the um, uh, SSH to the um, to it itself and just say like how many cores do I have? Which I don't know what the command is for that, but there is one I'm sure. Um, yeah, okay. So that's pretty much it for like slides and the lab itself. There's not much to say here. <laughs> um, I will say that I tried to um set up like a demo that would be a little bit more um, in depth, but I tried to use, uh, I tried to use, um, what is it called? VS code to sort of demonstrate that like, you don't have to, this isn't just about our studio. It's not just about Jupyter lab. There's all sorts of things that you can do on these uh, servers, but for the sake of demonstration, um, I'm just gonna do exactly what was in the lab uh, for the sake of time. So, we have this instance running that we set up from the previous lab. Where, where did I name it? I named it somewhere, DO for data science. But either way, it's one of these T2 micro instances that we, um, that we tried out. And basically, if you are running one of these and you are getting running into some sort of limitation with your um, computation, all you have to do is uh, just go to this uh, instances page, open it up, and in here, instance state, you just have to go to stop. Don't go to terminate. That's not what we want to do because if you terminate it, it disappears forever. So you can just stop it like this, um, and you should see the successfully stopped. And then you go to actions here, and you go to instance settings. You might have to reload the page. Actions and instance settings. Nope, still not there yet. There we go. So you might need to reload the page a couple of times while um, AWS updates everything. Um, but as long as it's stopped, you can go to actions and instance settings and you can change the instance type. And this allows you to pick um, uh, the different uh, configurations. So right now we're on T2 micro. We can change that to a small one and hit apply. It says change successfully. And then all we have to do is wait for it to give us the opportunity to go back to turn it on. Start instance. And give it a couple minutes. There we go. So that should be running now. So we've changed the instance from the micro to the small T2. And we'll see if it's still running. Cool. Looks good to me. Not much to say about that. Pretty straightforward. And um, there's no information about
yeah so i'm i'm assuming that this would change maybe if i have it up here no that's the same so plus that five plus it. um but yeah same instance i just stopped it increased the uh, size and came back and it works nothing much to say and that's the lab <laughs> any questions ideas thoughts i mean i at work i'm pretty limited with my compute resources and lately we've been diving into um like messing with uh, future and like fur as a replacement for map mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. I've been trying I think I finished it on Friday but I need to like really test it but essentially finding a way to automatically chunk my data so that I'm using as many cores as possible and as much as of my available RAM as possible but without any one process going over the the limit and sort of trying to find a way to like automatically balance that so that it's running as quickly as I can get it. But so far, like I just keep on hitting RAM limits, memory limits on each of my nodes. And so it's a little a little tricky. That's interesting. It's under so, for options. You can set the chunk size, which determines how many like list items are passed uh, at a time. Interesting. I yeah, I've never come across this problem. It's, for me, it's always like check how many you have and do that minus two. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, cool. I just leave it as is. Yeah. So wait, what? So like. You're saying that you've you're parallel. So like let's say it's 10, right? Let's say that it's 10. You're parallelizing over all 10, but you're yeah. you're hitting limitations within each worker. Yeah. So like if I don't have a large amount of RAM, if I have a large amount of cores and not a lot of RAM. Oh, okay. How so do I use all of my cores without hitting my RAM limits? Hmm. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, because traditionally you would have enough RAM that you're, you'd be able to use all of your cores to whatever level you would need. But uh, work is not necessarily the real world. So yeah. you might have some limitations to work with. And that's just something like. Yeah, I, the only thing I would say is like really carefully manage what is going to each worker yeah um, it's I but think. yeah <laughs> okay, let me double check my list size because it's like absurdly large so each list item there are over 7800 list items and each list item is a data frame of about four or five columns and like a hundred or so rows mm. But then each one is return each one of those list items returns a time series model from Fable. And so it ends up sort of ballooning in size. And yeah, that that sounds intense. <laughs> I'm not gonna yeah. lie, that sounds pretty intense. Um maybe so are you using this with um data it's frames all, or all, with tibbles or it's actually uh time series tibbles yeah which... and they don't have a data table equivalent for that no or time series tibbles, not. right yeah or at least not that i'm aware of but it's it's certainly interesting to work with and see yeah i don't think that there's a an out of the box I data table for I will wax poetic about the virtues of time series tibbles and They're pretty cool and fable and like future 
because if you they have keys which are essentially like groups but if you key your data and then pass it to a model function it will automatically do a grouped like model and forecast and then it's built off of future so you just have to do like plan and then it all just like happens but yeah i love this anyways that is so straightforward i love it it's pretty nifty But yeah, anyway, that's really what I wanted to get at was like sometimes you have a lot of cores and not a lot of RAM, and then trying to balance it is you have to be mindful, especially on Windows. Mm -hmm. This was something I found out this past week was that Windows can't do like if you look at future, you can do multi session or multi core. Yeah. And Windows can't do multi-core because it can't fork a process. So whenever you create a new, if you want to do something on a new core, you have to copy the entire process over. And so there's a lot of extra overhead in multi-session yeah. projects because you can't just fork it. And then that's essentially why I'm hitting these RAM limits is because now, instead of just being able to say, here, take this giant list and then only send the items you need, I have to send the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Which and almost so, defeats the purpose. Exactly. So then now it's, how can I send as many items or as many items as possible to each core without overloading it so that I'm not taking too much of a performance hit? Yeah, that that might I think like what John said is true. It might just be a it might just be a limitation of the oh, natural yeah, no. world. <laughs> it's, we're we're working on getting system upgrades. It just takes a while. So in the meantime, you have to learn all the little tricks to yeah. do what you can with what you have. Yeah, when I when I if I ever come to that uh scenario i will think of you <laughs> thanks <laughs> any other ideas or questions it looks like we've gone through it with uh 20 minutes to spare awesome yeah Cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'll make the PR and um, yeah, make sure everything is cleaned up and submitted in a couple hours. Yes. And um, so, yeah, next week will be uh, Project Club. So we'll be off. And then um, we need to sort out. Let's see, where are we right now? So that's that. And then, right, I need to bug Alex because in theory, in two weeks, we'll have Alex in to talk about all the stuff we've been looking at um, before going on to section four. Yeah. Um, he, like he was all, you know, he's excited to come in, but uh, the timing has changed a couple of times. So I need to just confirm with him that he'll be available. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we have a couple of weeks for that. So next week, I'll see you all over in Project Club. <laughs> Sweet. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye. Cheers. Bye.